Good afternoon. I'd like to call the uh, Transportation Policy and Finance Community meeting to order. And uh, thank you, members, for finding us. This room change was due to accommodate the media here so uh, for, the, for the television. So that's why we're here. And I think we, are, we do have a quorum. Oh, I thought we did. We do have 12. Okay. Um, I thought we do right here. We have we have no. Right. Okay. Uh, Representative Nash, would you like to uh, remove the minutes? So moved. Thank you. Uh, minutes have been moved by Representative Nash. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. And those are approved. Well, today we uh, have the. Uh, uh, rail safety presentation and we're going to uh, start out with that uh, right away here and who do we have up here okay yeah we we've done a uh, a couple of things here just in in regards to what's in your packet you you do have a little bit of a abbreviated uh, report we do have the full-blown report here that we will that we will uh, pass around and, and uh, distribute there so you'll have that information. But in your, in your packet, you have the um, condensed version here. So um, who will be coming up first? I think we have. Uh, All right. We're going to do the report. OK. So the representatives from MnDOT. Uh, Welcome to the committee and please uh, introduce yourself for the record and we can start. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Bill Gardner. I'm director of the Freight and Rail Office at the Minnesota Department of Transportation. I'm joined by Dave Christensen of our staff who heads up our rail planning activities. Uh, today we'd like to provide you with an overview of the freight rail system in Minnesota. Uh, with a focus really on the rail corridors that are carrying crude oil. We'll be presenting the findings and recommendations of a grade crossing safety study that we recently completed. Uh, and that is really just one strategy that's being employed to address the risks associated with crude by rail. Minnesota, as you'll be hearing in, in, in Dave's presentation, and there's some material in the back of the room, is very much a railroad state. We have a number of industries and businesses that are very reliant on, on rail as a cost-effective shipping uh, uh, option, one that connects them to markets not just in Minnesota, but nationally and internationally as well. Our goal is to really maximize the benefits of rail. However, we, we also need to be concerned about minimizing uh, safety risks that may be introduced into our communities and other adverse effects uh, that higher volumes of rail traffic, particularly those carrying hazmat, uh, may introduce into our communities. In the pr presentation, we'll be providing uh, a quick overview of the history of rail in Minnesota, its current regulatory structure, some current trends and issues, and then we'll go right to the specific findings of the Grade Crossing Improvement Study. Feel free to interrupt uh, the presentation anytime with your questions, and we'll do our best to answer those or get you the information at a later time. So I'll turn it over to Dave at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Dave Christensen, and, and I'll start with an overview of the railroad system in Minnesota. Uh, we currently have uh, uh, good railroad coverage in the state. We actually have the eighth largest rail system among the 50 states. Uh, we carry 250 million tons of pro product every year, about half originating or terminating in the state and the other half traveling through the state. Uh, about a third of our freight is carried by rail as opposed to the national average of about 16 uh, percent. And we've had steady growth in rail traffic. Uh, the last in year, year 2012, we set an all-time record for the tonnage of freight moved in the state. And even during the recession from 2008 to 2013, we had about a 2 percent per year annual growth. Um, railroads have been around since the beginning of the state. Uh, we had our first train in 1862 coming out of St. Paul headed north. Um, 
The Interstate Commerce Commission was enacted by Congress uh, a year after Minnesota enacted their own Interstate Commerce Act uh, regulating the railroads. In 1887, they took over all regulation of, of prices, routes, uh, mergers, activities, operations, safety, everything having to do with, with interstate commerce on the railroads. Uh, their peak of development was 1929, same in Minnesota as well as the country. Uh, in 1971, because of the reduction in passenger rail traffic on the railroads and the financial drain that that was causing, the federal government took over the passenger rail routes and created Amtrak service. That still continues to this day. In 1980, by that time, the freight railroads were at a, an all-time low as far as profitability. Uh, a third of the rail system in the country was in poor repair and bankrupt. And the Congress had to make a decision as whether or not to nationalize the railroads or to move ahead and deregulate them and allow them to, to reach a point of equilibrium. Uh, they chose deregulation in 1980, <coughs> along with deregulation of virtually every other transportation mode. Uh, in 1995, it was judged that the deregulation was a, a bridge too far, and they created the Surface Transportation Board and reinvigorated uh, some of the old interstate commerce principles and acts, gave them some regulatory power, and also improved the uh, government's role in regulating the railroads instead of, of local governments and states. Uh, like I say, in 2012, we reached an all-time high in Minnesota for, for traffic, and uh, we may exceed that this year. When the rail industry was, was uh, deregulated, they slowly returned to, re to profitability. Over the next 15 years, they took 60 railroads down to seven class ones in the United States and Canada. Uh, they reduced the track miles by half, even though they increased the number of, of tons moved. One of the things they did was they started using what they were good at, uh, full trains of cargo moving in bulk, uh, everything from ore to grain to, to uh, coal and, and now crude oil. That utilization improved their utility of available cars and locomotives and crews by a factor of three, allowing them to move that much. We also had a growth in short lines. Those branch lines were not considered viable or profitable by the main <coughs> class one railroads were spun off and currently are operating all over the state and all over the country, in fact, as independent operations that originate and terminate traffic. They're kind of the, the retail business of the railroad industry. Uh, as I mentioned, the railroads are primarily regulated by the federal government because it is interstate commerce, which is reserved in the Constitution as a federal uh, area of regulation. Uh, to balance that, the railroads have a public responsibility of common carriage that when a uh, product is tendered to them, they have to carry it uh, regardless of what it is. Uh, that balancing act is, is constantly in flux, but we have three agencies in federal government that take care of that today. One is the Federal Railroad Administration. They take care of Amtrak, passenger rail development, and safety. <coughs> a surface transportation board, as I mentioned, is an, an offshoot of the old ICC, Interstate Commerce Act and currently regulates service and rates as well as mergers and abandonments in the country. And then PHMSA, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, they've come to the forefront in just the last three years because of their regulation of hazardous materials and in particular things like tank car standards for moving crude oil. Uh, freight rail issues we have, of course, currently today, rail safety is, is at the top of the list, uh, particularly with hazardous materials. We've never had this volume of hazardous materials moving through the state at any time, not even a tenth of it is what we do today. Uh, rail, rail capacity and reliability, we saw that in the last year, where uh, because of the demand for rail service and, and limitations on their capacity and also bad weather and bumper crops and uh, the crude oil growth, there's been a mismatch of available capacity and the, the demand for their services, which has caused some real problems this last year, especially in our ag industry as well as, as coal, energy, and ore. Uh, the community impacts we've had because of this uh, loss of capacity and the slowdown of the railroad operations and the increase in traffic is block crossings, noise, vibration, a lot of community impacts. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it's things that local governments and state government are, are attempting to respond to as well as the federal government. The Bakken Shale oil and gas development in North Dakota, of course, has been at the crux of all this. Uh, the first commercially viable well was proven and tested in 2000. 
in the Bakken. Uh, that brought together the technologies of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling. Um, very high-tech stuff that allowed basically oil that had been locked up in, in impervious shale to be tapped. Uh, Large-scale drilling started in 2005. We started moving unit trains of rail because of a lack of pipeline capacity in the area uh, by 2009. In 2011, three more terminals were added. By today, we have 18 terminals in the Bakken shipping unit trains of oil. Um, on average, 10 trains a day leave the Bakken field. That field is expected to have a life of at least 40 years. To put it in perspective, uh, the Bakken has proven to be the third largest oil field ever discovered in the U.S., following the North Slope and the Permian Basin. Uh, it pumps uh, over 1.2 million barrels of oil today from existing wells. It's only a quarter developed, and those existing wells are providing about one out of every eight barrels of all oil produced in the United States from onshore or offshore sources. Uh, Bakken crew by rail covers a, a few major corridors, in particular the Burlington Road and the Santa Fe Corridor from Fargo through the Twin Cities and then into Wisconsin, uh, carries uh, most of the trains, of the seven trains that we have per day, five of those are carried on that BNSF main line. Another train per day goes down the west side of the state on BNSF headed for the Gulf Coast. And then the Canadian Pacific carries about one and a half trains per day from North Dakota through the Twin Cities and then down through the river cities uh, to La Crosse. Uh, crude by rail issues we have, uh, currently only about a third of the oil moving out of the Bakken is moving by pipeline. They're using 100 percent of available capacity. And the flexibility of the rail option, because they are a common carrier and can go any place in the U.S., has been key to their being used. They cost about 50 percent more to move oil by <coughs> rail than by pipeline. But because they can go anywhere that there's a contract, they can move oil to refineries that are not being fed by pipelines in this area. Uh, particularly on the East Coast in Philadelphia, Jersey, and, and uh, New York. Uh, Bakken crude is very volatile. Uh, it carries a lot of what we call natural gas liquids, light ends like the liquid butane you have in your lighter, uh, propanes, uh, things that can be shipped in liquid form and mixed in with the rest of the crude oil, but it creates a very low flash point, something that causes the ignitability of the oil in the case of a rupture or a spill to be very high. Uh, and that's one of the basic problems that we have with moving this. And then the safety of the tank cars and the railroad system. Uh, one, we have a railroad system that is still becoming safer and building more capacity, but as we move ahead, there's always a chance of, of a minor fracture of rail or something being missed in uh, human error that can cause an accident. And then the tank car designs we're using uh, were designed in the 1960s, the DOT 111 car. The Association of American Railroads and tank car manufacturers passed tighter standards in 2011, the 1232 standards, but the federal government never adopted them. Uh, they are just in the process now of making final rules to adopt a new standard, a safer tank car, that will uh, make things much safer uh, at higher speeds for rail transportation of crude oil. But it will take probably three years to build up the fleet enough to be able to take all the oils moving out of the Bakken. Uh, some of the things the state has done in the last session, we increased track and hazardous materials inspectors. We added two new inspectors to our, our state employees that are doing, that are working in the stead of the federal government. Uh, we expanded emergency responder trainings through the Department of Public Safety and emergency preparedness plans, the DPS and PCA are requiring from the railroads to, to make sure they're prepared for a spill or, or a, a catastrophic uh, fire. And of course, we're increasing grade crossing safety wherever we can. The legislature approved $2 million last year. We just completed the crude oil grade crossing improvement and safety study that you have in front of you. And uh, we're proceeding to implement those initial findings for, for short-term short improvements. But the federal government, of course, is, is uh, working constantly on emergency rules for operating safety, uh, tank car standards, and more inspections. They have, in the last year, assigned three new inspectors themselves to Minnesota just to make sure that, that as the cops on the beat, the railroad inspectors and the track maintenance crews and everybody else are, are doing their jobs and keeping <coughs> on top of it. Uh, some of the other things that have happened, North Dakota has passed an oil stabilization rule which removes some of those natural gas liquids and light ends from the barrel. 
Uh, it increases the flash point, makes the oil less less uh, ignitable, but it's still something that if, if it catches on fire, you have a very catastrophic fire, very very hot fire that burns until it's, it's burned out. Uh, basically, you have to evacuate people within a half mile of such a fire because of the, the, the severe nature of it. And then, of course, pipeline expansion is happening on a daily basis uh, with private pipeline system, also common carriers uh, in interstate commerce. But it's a case of, of them taking three to five years to build new pipeline capacity. Uh, because of the drop in oil prices, crude oil prices on the world market today, uh, the drilling in North Dakota is slowing down. That's the good news. It gives us a little breathing space. Um, the bad news is that the oil that's currently coming out of the ground, the 1.2 million barrels a day, the, the 10 train loads out of Bakken and the seven trains coming from Minnesota, will not be reduced in the near future until those old wells start declining in production. Um, so we're not reducing the number of trains, but we are saving the growth in future train traffic. We had looked at possible growth in the Bakken and California and Canadian crude uh, middle of last year with the Commerce Department and projected that if high prices continued and growth continued in these fields, we would see up to 12 to 15 trains by 2023. Uh, at least that appears to be slacking now. Our grid crossing study looked at 700 miles of track, 683 crossings. We evaluated every one of those crossings for adequacy of safety and also risk. We created a new methodology that looked at the number of people that were within the area of that half mile buffer zone of the rail track and especially a half mile of a grade crossing where there could be a significant collision and derailment that could cause a fire. Uh, we identified those impact zones. We looked at the top 100 for possible improvements and we actually did traffic counts and detailed mapping on the top 40. Uh, we concentrated especially on the interactions of available populations in those areas. So we looked at, at risk and safety more so than, than collision reduction, uh, which is a conventional way of looking at grade crossing safety. So when we looked at an area, for instance, in St. Paul, we, we identified an area, for instance, that a grade crossing might have 3,500 people within that half mile zone. It would have to be evacuated immediately if there was an incident and judged and ranked our crossings on that basis. Uh, like I said, we looked at safety installations. We did risk-based scoring. Uh, we went out to most of the communities, especially on, on the immediate at-grade crossing improvements that we were projecting with the $2 million. Uh, the governor conducted 10 roundtables around the state on rail safety. Uh, and several of us were in attendance at every one of those. We took a lot of the input from that and built it into the study. And then we did a final risk management assessment in December where we looked at the risk of not only catastrophic incidents at grade crossings, but also what was happening with what we'd heard at the roundtables. And that was that emergency responders were, were being blocked at crossings by the huge train traffic on some of these main lines. Uh, they weren't being able to respond to emergency calls for fires, heart attacks, uh, strokes, things of that sort. Uh, and that risk, through the risk management tool, we found was equal to the risk of catastrophic events. Uh, so that led to the recommendation in our report that we not only look at at-grade crossing safety improvements, but also grade separations and possible ways to improve emergency response in those communities that might be cut off by heavy train traffic. I said our recommended strategies covered everything that was written into the law and then some. We looked at eliminating grade crossings. Uh, some of our short-term projects in, involved that. Uh, improving signage and warnings. Uh, interconnect with traffic signals. We looked at, at medians to prevent drive arounds of gates. Uh, we looked at education programs, which we already have with Operation Lifesaver around the state, but that, that in local areas of, of high risk, we could do even more to, to make things safer through education. And then, of course, enforcement of laws at, at grade crossings. Our recommendations came down to 10 short-term projects, one education project, and nine physical grade crossing improvements of the $2 million appropriations. We identified uh, over 40 intermediate term at grade crossing improvements that could be done that would improve safety on these crude oil routes. And then we looked at 15 individual projects where we either had projects planned or requests made by communities to do grade separations, again, to respond to the risk 
of block crossings and emergency access as well as just community circulation. Uh, some of the things we looked at here on, on the slides, you can see our strategies. Uh, a median that prevents drive arounds is very important. Of the 1,000 accidents in the U.S. last year, 250 of those grade crossing accidents were caused, caused by drive arounds at gates. Uh, putting in four quad gates, uh, tying in the intersections and traffic signals so you don't have queues like you see on here. Traffic blocking across the, the uh, railroad tracks. Of course, if somebody can't move from their car and the train is coming, that train is going to take a half mile to three miles to stop, depending on the speed and weight. Uh, so the thing is to keep the traffic out of the way. And then of course, see one of the accidents, one of our, our uh, MnDOT heavy vehicles that uh, was involved in a train collision. The biggest issue that we have is a heavy commercial vehicle that may weigh uh, 40 tons being at a grade crossing, uh, whether loaded with just grain or gasoline or anything else, and having a collision that could derail the train as well as destroy that vehicle. So at that point, we will open it for questions and, uh, and respond to any issues you might have. Thank you, Mr. Gardner, Mr. Christensen. Uh, have you planned on, from a presentation standpoint, to talk about the specific um, handouts that that we've included here, like the the priority um, recommendations and and more on the, the rail safety itself, or or were you just is that how you wanted to handle the questions? I guess uh, we are prepared to talk to talk about individual projects, although most are still in the planning stage. We would uh, rather answer more general questions about about safety or the issues having to do with with crude oil transportation. Okay, well, I, I guess we'll, we'll probably get to that then as, as we get questions. And uh, maybe one of the first questions I'd have is just how the, the coordinated effort between the federal uh, guidelines that we're under and, and some of the federal programs that are initiatives for safety, uh, could you maybe speak about that a little bit in regards to, uh, as you said, the, the recommendations on the oil cars? I know there's, there's braking uh, issues, and, and we would like to take that, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, the, we are specifically coordinating in the area of rail inspection. Uh, we've increased the number of rail inspectors and state rail inspectors in Minnesota from one track uh, rail inspector uh, to uh, uh, three rail inspectors total, including one hazmat. And that's under a federally organized program uh, where basically our state rail inspectors have delegated authority to enforce both federal and state regulations uh, for that work. So they are able to identify defects. Uh, they are able to write citations, essentially, and ensure that those defects are corrected. But the railroads themselves still have primary responsibility for inspection, safety, maintenance, and so forth. So it's a large degree of oversight uh, of that program as well. There are currently two state track inspectors, uh, one hazmat inspector, uh, at the state level and uh, an equivalent amount of federal inspectors working in the state. Uh, I'm not sure, Dave, if you have any, uh, anything to add in any of the other areas? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. The issues where there are is federal regulation and basically preemption of, of local law, we still have taken an active part in that. Uh, we have commented on the tank car rulemaking and safety standards uh, at the governor's level and also through our federal delegation. Uh, the department has commented on technical issues having to do with, with operating safety, uh, track inspections, grade crossing safety uh, with the FRA and the STB. Um, we have provided input to the state of North Dakota and the industrial commission there as to the stabilization of oil. So wherever there is an opportunity for us to act and provide both technical, technical assistance and political will uh, to make these improvements happen, we've, we've been active in, in following that up. Thank you. Uh, we do have several questions. Uh, Representative Hausman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I don't know if I'm going to use the right terminology, but what I remember um, in last year's discussions about some of this around um, enforcement and public safety and so forth, I, I sort of recall um, the railroad saying that they, in most other states, they have their own, wh whether it's law enforcement or public safety, or I don't know what the terminology of the, of the people is, that other states allow them a role, but in our state we uh, we provide our own personnel, and so we differ from other states in in uh, not taking advantage of the personnel that the railroads have. I don't know if I'm understanding that correctly, but 
I sort of remembered a, a suggestion about this. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, yes, the railroads do have uh, concerns that they do not have full railroad police powers as they do in other states, and that's particularly important uh, to enforce trespassing uh, violations, people walking, driving, hunting on their property, which can not only be dangerous, but now that we have a lot of hazmat materials sitting in tanker cars and so forth, there's a lot of concern about uh, kind of getting ahead of the curve and being able to, to address those, those concerns. And so Minnesota, as we understand, is one of only two states that don't have those full railroad police uh, uh, powers at this time. And Mr. Chair, if I could just follow up, do we know no. wh why are why are we an outlier? What what's the issue there, Mr. Gardner? Mr. Chair, Representative, I, I think it's just the the historical development of our uh, regulatory structure here in the state and a uh, reluctance to go in that direction is my understanding. Representative Hornstein. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thanks for having this hearing, and uh, I appreciate the work that MnDOT's done on this study. Uh, that we talked about you all doing in the legislation last year. So I just have a couple questions. Um, as we have really exposed the, a lot of the risks of crude by rail, uh, there's been a lot of discussion around here at the legislature and, and the gubernatorial campaign about, well, let's build all these pipelines because that's somehow, that's safer, that's a better alternative. And Mr. Christensen, I know that you've testified in the past uh, about this isn't really an, an accurate comparison and I, I interested if you could comment a little on that, that somehow the, the pipelines aren't necessarily going to alleviate this problem. Mr. Chair, Representative Hornstein, uh, the facts of the matter are that we have seven to 800,000 barrels of crude moving by rail every day out of the Bakken currently. And like I had mentioned before, we don't expect that to decrease significantly over the next three to five years. Um, pipelines like the Sandpiper Pipeline, uh, are expected to move between 270 to 400,000 barrels of oil, only a fraction of what's moving by rail today. Uh, there is also increasing crude oil coming out of Canada from the tar sands. Uh, and I won't get into the Keystone issue, but it's, it's a matter that with the railroad's flexibility and their operations up there, they also are looking at moving rail through Minnesota from Alberta to West Coast and East Coast refineries. Um, and so everything that we looked at said that, that despite the fact that, that pipelines could divert uh, crude from rail, it's not going to happen fast enough or in the volume that will remove crude by rail from our railroads uh, on a permanent basis. We expect that even 10 years down the road, uh, we will have a significant number of, of crude oil trains whether because it's more flexible for the contractors to move it that way or just simply because we still won't have enough pipelines built to handle the, the demand. Thank you. And then I have one other question. Representative Horsey. Thank you. And um, you know, when this, your study was released, there was a lot of discussion about the price tag. And I, I really appreciate the fact that you talked about population densities, vulnerable populations, uh, EMS services. I, I think the criteria you used to prioritize these grade crossings was a helpful one because we do have a lot of populations at risk. But um, has it been traditional that the state has picked up the tab for this? Um, uh, are the railroads kicking in any? And if they are, is it enough? Mr. Gardner. Mr. Chair, Representative, our traditional grade crossing improvement program has, has been roughly in the order of about $7 million per year, used primarily to upgrade cross buck unprotected passive crossings to gate and signal systems. And the bulk of that money, the, the vast majority of that, that funding is actually through a federal, uh, federal safety program from the Federal Highway uh, Administration in particular because the thinking is that grade crossing safety is primarily for the benefit of motorists. We have a little bit different situation now with hazmat and, and, and communities being affected, block crossings and so forth. So there's some rethinking going on about uh, sort of who benefits and who should pay. And certainly there's a lot of discussion on, on that topic. Well, Mr. Chair, I would just say, and I know the Senate is addressing this in their bill, um, but I think given the, the volume uh, that we're seeing of, of these, these oil trains, um, projected increases in these trains, other hazmat, um, I really strongly believe that this should be a cost that's shared between 
uh, the taxpayer and the railroads who are benefiting tremendously from this. So I'd like to see a lot more private sector uh, involvement in this. I don't want this to be, you know, kind of a subsidy in a sense to, to the railroads because this is something worth investing in. I think your report indicates that. But I don't think this should be solely on the backs of our, our taxpayers, particularly because the private sector is benefiting uh, tremendously. And, and we're not getting a lot of benefits in the state. Uh, we're just a, a through fare for this oil that's heading to the east and the south of us. And so I hope we can look at this a little bit differently, because this is a, a multi, several hundred million dollar price tag, I believe. Uh, and so if we were to break down between the federal share, the railroad share, and the state share, um, I think that we need to up the up what we're asking the railroads, because I don't think we have the money either in the bonding or in other places to, to pay for this, and which is needed and should be a priority. Thank you. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I have uh, just uh, two questions, actually. One is getting back to the inspectors. Uh, currently, we have, if I understand you right, two inspectors plus one hazmat inspector, so a total of three. Do we have potential of increasing that under the current appropriations and stuff? Seems to me Last year, didn't we increase it by one or two years ago as, as well? Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, we do have the option under last year's legislation upon conferring with the railroads uh, to add one additional inspector, which we are currently uh, evaluating the need for that. We've been in discussions with the federal government, with the Federal Railroad, Railroad Administration about what they perceive to be any gaps in coverage uh, there are a number of discipline areas that we potentially could get into. Right now, we're limited to track and hazmat, but there are also specialists who evaluate things like operating practices, the actual uh, train set equipment, brakes, engines, so forth, uh, signal systems at crossings, and, and so forth. So those are other potential areas uh, uh, that we need to think about. And if I could carry on, Mr. Chair? Representative. Um, uh, following up on that question, I also I'm very much aware that railroads themselves also have a lot of inspectors as well. I mean, it's, it's as important to them as it is to the state uh, because of, of liability and so forth. Do you offhand know how many inspectors from the various um, companies are, are assigned to Minnesota area or cover this area as well in private sector? Um, Mr. Chair, Representative, I don't have a specific number. Uh, typically, they may not even call them, uh, use the name inspector. It may be maintenance folks. Uh, in a variety of capacities, uh, particularly on the on the large class one uh, crude oil routes, uh, the maintenance is, is generally excellent, and there's a high level of inspection. They're they're currently exceeding the required federal inspection levels on those routes, uh, and so we we don't typically see a lot of problems on those routes in particular. But it's something that really does need to be uh, continue to be evaluated and reviewed. Mr. Chair, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. On, on a different subject, the question that I have is in regards to volume and capacity. As as you know, there are a lot of industries. Agriculture is one. Uh, sometimes aggregate and coal are another area that has utilized the trains for a long period of time and have kind of been dependent upon it. And then comes in uh, the Bakken crude oil coming through, which has really taken away a lot of the capacity for that. Are you aware, and this may be a better question for some of the railroads, but are you aware of any options or opportunities we have to expand the capacity of the rail system itself to accommodate uh, the existing markets that had been using it versus now the crude oil? Yes, Mr. Chair, Representative. Uh, the railroads are currently entering into a record level of capital investments, particularly here in the state of Minnesota and the, the Dakotas. Um, the BNSF has just announced a capital expansion program that includes a major amount of double tracking that uh, increases their capacity on a given line by as much as two and a half times over. Uh, they are aware that, that uh, the velocity of the system, the capacity of the system needs uh, rapid upgrades uh, and they're doing that as fast as possible. Canadian Pacific, Canadian National and Union Pacific have also entered into uh, major capital improvements in the state uh, that will occur over the next three years. Um, that said, you know, we have uh, uh, service issues right now that we're trying to stay ahead of. I say we, you know, speaking on behalf of the state DOT and the railroads and our shippers, uh, that uh, continues to be worrisome. And uh, 
The crude oil itself only accounts for about 15 percent of the traffic on the main lines that carry it. But because of bumper crops of, of everything from ore to coal to grain uh, over the last two years in the state, uh, we just have exceeded the capacity of the system in, in many different areas. And so uh, uh, we'll leave that for the railroads to respond further. Thank you. All right. Representative Buglin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> I represent the city of Coon Rapids, which has one of the most used rail lines going through a metro area uh, here. And uh, my constituents are, are, are very, very concerned about what happened in Quebec, what happened in North Dakota in terms of uh, a fire uh, and uh, a catastrophic accident, um, <clears throat> particularly with many, many homes being in close proximity and things like that. Could you take me through the scenario of how well we are prepared, both the railroads and, and the state, to fight a major oil train fire in the metro area? Mr. Mr. Garden. Chair, Representative, uh, obviously the Department of Public Safety uh, and others representing the emergency response community could pr provide a, a much better response than we can as a result of the legislation that was passed last year and ongoing work by the railroads and the, the state agencies. That level of preparedness and response is certainly improving. There's a number of specific activities, including training, uh, improving facilities, preparing plans, and, and improving coordination between public and private responders is going on. Uh, but more detail than that, I would refer that to the uh, other state agencies. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> Is it true, though, that, because uh, I know it's the case in, in uh, Coon Rapids, that uh, local fire departments on the whole uh, are wholly unprepared to deal with a major fire like this because of foam supplies and things like that? You should know that answer. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Representative. Um, the issue has improved a lot in the last year. Uh, a year ago, I think it was safe to say that about half of the emergency response units along these major railroad routes uh, were totally unprepared in terms of training or even being aware that there was crude moving on, on the railroad lines. Uh, that has changed drastically with the help of the railroads and the Department of Public <coughs> Safety. Uh, training has probably improved to better than 90 percent. Uh, that said, in a catastrophic fire that we're looking at, which this is flammable material, it burns very hot, about 4,000 degrees at its core. Uh, the preferred method of response is first evacuation within a half mile of the fire. Uh, that is a burn radius we saw in many incidents, including Castleton and La Magantie in Quebec. Um, so first, the police and the fire have to coordinate on that. Uh, secondly, then, to fight the fire and to control it uh, as it's burning, you have to have foam. You can't use water. It just spreads the fire. Uh, and that uh, access to foam in, involves a close coordination, which is part of the training, between uh, local airports, fire departments, the railroads themselves who stock foam and, and equipment at very pl various places along the railroad, and contracted emergency <coughs> responders. A uh, state duty officer plays a key part there, but, but the, of course, the incident managers, the first responders at the site are the ones who have the first responsibility for kicking this off and, and responding to it. So they are better prepared. Uh, in the case of a major fire like we saw in La Magantie, uh, where 47 people died, um, there is no easy way to, to fight that fire and to respond to it, which is why we are spending so much time on prevention. Okay. Guess you've covered it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Sundin. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to talk about uh, prevention a little bit as well. Uh, the tank cars themselves, uh, as mentioned today, they uh, probably have a some of them on, uh, on the rail, rails actually have antique value uh, because they've been around so long and that design is uh, actually antiquated as well. Uh, last year we heard testimony that there are actually about 79,000 of those tank cars traveling the railways in the United States that are of substandard or uh, antiquated uh, design and construction. And you mentioned today that there's a move towards uh, correcting that and uh, getting better tank cars on the rails here in Minnesota. You said three years there'd be enough. There would be enough uh, tank cars 
to uh, satisfy the needs here uh, in Minnesota. But I, I find that hard to believe that uh, 79,000 of uh, these uh, time bombs are, uh, uh, are going to be repaired all at once. And what's the likelihood of Minnesota seeing all of those, uh, uh, that new fleet of tank cars? Mr. Chair, Mr. Representative, uh, the three-year timeline for replacing those cars, your numbers are, are factually correct. That is about the number of tank cars being used in Bakken trains today that are not at the 1232 standard. They're at the older DOT 111 standard. Um, the tank car industry today is, consists of seven manufacturers. They turn out about 80,000 cars a year, uh, replacements for old cars. There are, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of cars rolling the riding the rails today. Um, if we concentrate as the federal law, the FEMSA and FRA rules have concentrated on, of uh, just the Bakken crude oil, uh, basically all the new tank car construction, once the rules are adopted for the safer design, will concentrate on the use of new cars in those unit trains coming out of the Bakken, the highest risk area. Uh, and so a major percentage of, percent of the construction every year will go toward that end. Uh, the tank car manufacturers themselves, as well as the FRA and PIMSA, have agreed that three years is a doable time frame. Uh, that said, that leaves us a gap of three years while we still have deficient tank cars carrying some of the crude before everything is replaced. Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I apologize. I was a little late, but gathering in on the discussion here. and. Um, I, th I thought I heard and I was listening intently of the discussion that Representative Hornstein was having um, with you uh, about uh, the decrease in volume that could be anticipated if uh, what I understand uh, would amount to nothing more than the government getting out of the way of the ability for the Sandpiper pipeline to develop. Uh, we could reduce the volume, I thought I heard, um, of oil on trains by 50, up to 50 percent. Uh, so my question to you is, uh, is there anything to suggest that that decrease of volume by 50 percent would not decrease the, uh, the incidence or the uh, uh, potential uh, for uh, a major accident um, resulting from Bakken crude oil uh, by an equivalent 50 percent? Or maybe it would be more than that uh, as you um, uh, decrease the ability for collisions with these types of vehicles. I'm not sure, but I'd be interested. Uh, I was really kind of uh, surprised by your response when you suggested it wasn't significant. To me, a 50 percent reduction in the overnight, uh, well, not overnight, but uh, without uh, having to extract it from the taxpayers in order to do this, um, which we may still have to do on top of that, we don't know, uh, but to uh, at least not acknowledge a 50 percent reduction is significant was very surprising to me. So I'd be interested for you to elaborate further. Mr. Chair, Mr. Christian, Representative, um, it is safe to say that if there is a 50 percent reduction in train traffic, that assumes that the growth of the Bakken will stop uh, and that pipelines will be built in a, in a fairly timely fashion. Uh, that would reduce but not eliminate the number of trains running through the state. The flip side of that analysis is that if crude prices go back up to the, rec to the levels that we saw just a few months ago, uh, the Bakken is poised to, to open up new wells at a, almost a, a record rate that would make your, uh, you know, that would be equal to the, to the current field development that we've seen over the last three years. And uh, within a matter of, of months, we could see uh, many new trains appearing on a rail again. Well, Mr. Chair, I'm, just gonna uh, I'm kind of confused. So, I mean, they're going to do that regardless of what, whether or not we build a pipeline, right? I mean, they're going to. They're going, to, they're going to figure out how to do it. The markets are going to drive that. It's not going to be our decision on whether or not we get government out of the way of, of companies that want to build a very safe pipeline to transport this oil and free up the space on these trains, which, as I understand, uh, the corn and soybean farmers in western Minnesota would like to see their basis uh, get about 50 to 80 percent better than it is and get us out of $3 corn territory, uh, which uh, government uh, failure to act here and get out of the way of, of uh, the private sector is providing for them. So um, don't you agree that uh, uh, they will figure out how to transport and produce that oil if the economies are uh, completely independent of this decision we're talking about? Mr. Chair, Representative, 
I think your conclusions are, are supportable. I wouldn't want to, uh, you know, potentially try to prophesy where the market's going or what's going to happen with the volumes, except that is one potential outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go on, I'd like to welcome former Chair Mike Beard to our committee. We appreciate you being here. Chair Beard, welcome. Uh, Representative Earhart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, when we build uh, commuter uh, stuff like buses and rails, uh, we don't expect to take all the cars off the road, but we do expect to alleviate much of the traffic uh, that's done by single drivers and get them into uh, vehicles that move uh, in, in mass and also as an environmental uh, uh, plus as well. So uh, when pipelines are built, I don't think that we uh, expect to replace all the rail cars, but we certainly uh, are talking about supplementing them. So my question is, who makes the investment in railroad tank cars and other upgrades versus uh, the pipeline development? What is the uh, cost differential between uh, railroad upgrade uh, versus the new pipeline? And who, sh who, who uh, fronts the monies on those? Can you give me an example of that? Mr. Chair, Representative, um, the private industry, mainly the oil companies and the leasing companies, are the ones that pay for new car construction for tank cars. Uh, and when it comes to pipelines, the oil companies basically front the money for the pipeline construction. Uh, they do anything from five to 20 year subscriptions <coughs> where they guarantee filling the pipeline before it's ever built. Uh, so it's all private money. Um, and that goes with the railroad expansion for capacity as well. Well, Mr. Chair, it seems to me we should not just sweep uh, pipelines aside then and that we should encourage the railroads to continue their uh, efforts to uh, revamp and up-ramp their uh, facilities and uh, pipelines as well. Mm -hmm. Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a question about the priority grade separation recommendations sheets um, and, and how that works. Um, I note that St. Paul Como Avenue it, it's described as a key oil route, and the crossings are within a very dense populated area. And I don't see that phrase, dense, very dense populated area, in a description of any of the others. But yet there's been no study completed under project readiness and the status, no planning study completed. So how does that decision get made? Why is there no work on that? And if I mean, when, it's, when it says very dense populated area, I would think that would somehow raise it up a little bit in priority. Yeah. Thank you, Representative Hausman. And, and as you answer that, I guess I had a couple of questions. If you could maybe walk through a little bit of that criteria on, on maybe the top, top projects there and, and probably goes right to Representative Hausman's question. Correct. Mr. Chair, Representative Hausman, uh, the methodology that we developed looked, as you say, at risk at the uh, uh, populations of residents that were in the half mile zone, uh, vulnerable populations such as hospitals and prisons, transient populations such as, as schools and special events, uh, the location of facilities for public safety such as fire departments and, and police. Uh, we looked at all those variables and mapped them and, and scored them. Uh, we then looked at the, at the uh, prioritization of possible routes also in the real world, of what had been studied already. Uh, we have several projects that are shovel ready, essentially, uh, around the state, but don't have funds to move ahead. Uh, we have others that have been the, the subject of planning studies, like uh, Coon Rapids and Anoka County, um, where they have evaluated and selected where they would like to have grade separation projects. Uh, and then there are those that have been requested uh, by concerned communities, but there's been no planning or development work of any kind done on them yet. Uh, that planning work and, and uh, design and costing methodology itself takes several years to perform. Um, so part of what we did is we looked at the 15 grade separations on these key crude routes that would have a, a very positive public benefit in terms of emergency response and, and safety. 
and then prioritize them basically in, in also deliverability. So we ranked those that could be done in the immediate future at the top of the list. Uh, Como Avenue did come up with the highest density in the half mile uh, impact zone, uh, but a grade crossing that has already been uh, treated with quad gates uh, has a very low but not uh, zero accident record. We've had people who've driven through the gates. That's always an issue. It's not a truck route, uh, which is a major consideration, although there is a Metro Transit bus routes across that line, and, and a heavy bus is just as bad as, as hitting a, a heavy truck, uh, just as much an immovable object. So we looked at those differences in local conditions and ranked them and prioritized those uh, based on both readiness and risk. So that's why Como Avenue is, is lo listed as a high risk environment. Uh, there are senior high rises right next to the grade crossing and uh, heavy traffic volume both on the, the road and, and the train, but no heavy trucks. And the fact that the city of St. Paul nor MnDOT or anybody else is, has done any significant planning on a grade separation at that spot yet. Thank you very much. At this point in time, there's there's no further questions, and we would like to get the representatives from oh, the railroads. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry, Representative. Chair, I just wanted to yep. make one quick comment. Um, you know, Representative Uglum made a, a very good point, um, and uh, I know that, Mr. Chairman, you're looking at uh, hearing this companion report that the Depart Department of Public Safety released last week about the gaps in response to oil and pipeline spills. and. You know, there was some troubling things I found in that report. One was that only a third of the first responders felt that they were equipped to deal with a problem like this. And uh, there was a rating of 2.6 out of 5 in terms of our preparedness. So as we get into that uh, discussion, I think Representative Uglum's points um, were well taken, and we should, we should talk a little about that. And I, I just wanted to make one comment about um, uh, Representative Sundin's line of questioning around these tanker cars. You know, it's my understanding that, um, uh, as Mr. Christensen pointed out, that we can replace these in three years, uh, but the railroad and oil industry are lobbying very hard in Washington to actually move that out to 10 years or beyond. And I think that is a huge problem. You know, when we have any incident with any other mode of transportation, you know, a, a, a DC-10 goes down, you know, at O'Hare Airport in 79, they grounded the DC-10s. You know, we take pretty extreme measures until we can get things corrected and up to speed. And so I'm very concerned about the lobbying that's going on in Washington, D.C. On, on these rules. So I hope, you know, that'll be an item of conversation, I think, as we move forward. All right. Thank you. Uh, Representative Whalen, you have one, one last question here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a clarification question, and I apologize if it was already answered, but on these two handouts, the priority grade separation recommendations and high priority crude by rail grade crossing list. Um, there's a project in Anoka. I represent Anoka. Um, it's number six on one of them, BNSF Anoka Ferry, uh, Ferry Street. And then on this list, it's number 64. And I'm just wondering um, how, what the changes there, how they got placed. Mr. Kutcher, Representative. Uh, Ferry Street is a very high volume route. It's right next to a commuter rail station. It is a state trunk highway. Um, and it's a built up area. So the cost of putting in a grade separation is considered relatively high. Uh, that said, we have been constantly improving the, the safety treatments of that area with escape zones, uh, improved grade crossing circuitry and uh, gates and, and uh, signal systems. Uh, we're looking at, at further at grade safety improvements and that ranking of 64 is if we were looking at just at grade separations. That said, it was requested by Anoka County uh, and in our roundtables to be on the requested grade separation list uh, because of the fact that so much traffic does go over that and it is a major emergency route for response uh, in the city. So given those two considerations, uh, it's on both lists as a priority, but of course high on the list of grade separation because of the necessity for community response. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gardner, Mr. Christensen. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Now, Mr. Sweeney. <laughs> you can keep us up 
Thank Mr. you, Mr. Appitz. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Brian Sweeney with BNSF Railway Company in St. Paul. I uh, wanted to take this opportunity to update the committee on uh, some of the issues that were raised in the last session in terms of uh, oil train safety, but also the service issues and, and the capital investment uh, discussions that we, that we had. First, uh, in the area of uh, capital spending in the packet, I believe, is a map uh, showing uh, BNSF's proposed capital projects for this coming year. The major projects uh, on our system, we have a $6 billion capital spending program this year. That's up from $5 billion last year, which was a record at that time. Uh, of the $6 billion, about $1.5 billion is being spent on our northern corridor, the eight states from Washington across the northern tier and then down to Illinois. Uh, of that, about $700 million is going into capital expansion or uh, uh, projects that would improve our capacity, whether through signal systems or track construction. Included in that, in, starting in Minnesota this year, are some significant double tracking projects that were mentioned earlier. Areas where we have, currently have a single track and we're going to be adding a second main line. Uh, three locations on what is uh, called our Staples subdivision, which is roughly the line heading uh, north from the Twin Cities to St. Cloud and beyond. So we're uh, going to be, uh, this is going to be a cost of uh, several hundred million dollars when all is said and done. But it's adding uh, double track in those areas, also adding some double track in the Twin Cities area. Uh, in St. Paul, uh, actually adding a third track uh, in the area around our Dayton's Bluff Yard. <coughs> Also some signal upgrades, uh, improved signal systems that allow for handling a, a greater capacity of traffic. And as we discussed earlier, this is, uh, this is part of an ongoing effort that we're undertaking to resolve the problems that we have with capacity, with the economic recovery that has taken place. A lot of the traffic came back in places where it hadn't been before. So uh, in the Twin Cities division, which includes Minnesota and the Dakotas roughly, part of Wisconsin, uh, we went from 140 trains a day a couple years, three years ago, to about 200 trains a day now. A pretty substantial increase in traffic in that territory. And uh, we've been hearing about oil, but it's a lot more than oil. Oil uh, is one commodity, but coal traffic, for example, has also uh, gone up substantially. Uh, we had, uh, at one point, we had increased the number of coal train sets, uh, cars and locomotives, by 150 on the system. That by itself is bigger than our entire fleet of grain shuttle trains. So just the growth in coal traffic was that big. We've also had substantial growth in our intermodal traffic. Uh, uh, just about any line of traffic you can think of, uh, the traffic volume has gone up. So we had a system that, uh, that was strained for capacity. That showed up in the service problems that we had last year. As the projects that we did last year, uh, including some double tracking projects in the Dakotas, or in North Dakota and Montana. As those have come online bit by bit, the overall uh, flow of traffic has improved. The fluidity of the system has gotten better. So that not only has helped with the, uh, handling the volume, but also it, the more we can improve the fluidity of the system, the more that will help with some of these block crossing problems that we've been hearing about, where especially in winter time, for example, the volume of trains waiting to use uh, the track, uh, they wind up being stopped and for an extended period of time. It's like a gridlock type of situation. So as we can improve capacity and the movement of traffic, that helps with that situation as well. Uh, with the uh, oil traffic, uh, a couple of rulemakings that are underway right now at the federal level, uh, just to update you on. One is the tank car rulemaking. Uh, tank cars, I think, as kind of in, pointed out, we don't own the tank cars. Those are owned by the customers. Uh, the customer provides the equipment as a common carrier, as Dave Christensen mentioned, we're required to take a commodity that's properly tended to us in an approved car. And the DOT 111 car is currently approved. This is, you know, as has been pointed out, the old workhorse of the fleet. The rail industry has been advocating for an improved design for, uh, for a few years now. 
The rulemaking on tank car standards, I believe, is scheduled to be wrapped up sometime in the spring, probably in May. So that uh, we should see then what the, what the lay of the land is for tank cars going down the line. Uh, what the industry has advocated is a thicker shell, a thermal blanket wrapped around that shell, and then an outer shell over the blanket, as long as full head shields. Uh, currently, uh, at the ends of the cars are only partially protected with shields uh, in the event of a derailment. So we're advocating uh, full head shields and, and various other safety improvements with the cars. Um, also, there's a rulemaking that's going to be underway regarding response plans for uh, incidents involving uh, commodities such as the oil. Uh, that's going to be uh, published, I believe, in, at the end of August with comments due by the end of October. So there's more action going on at the federal level, too, with, uh, with response planning and preparedness. Um, some of the things that we're doing with oil train safety, um, I know there are several new members, but uh, so, I'll, so I'll go over some of that. Following the, the accidents, uh, uh, Lake Megantic and, uh, and the Castleton accident, the U.S. rail industry entered into an agreement with U.S. DOT covering various aspects of oil train operations. One is increased inspections of the track, uh, more frequent inspections than would typically be required, also increasing the use of uh, uh, mechanical type inspections, if you will, uh, track geometry cars uh, that patrol the track, measuring the curvature and uh, how even the rail is, uh, the use of uh, ultrasound equipment that can detect flaws within the rail, things of that nature. So we're stepping up the inspections. Also, we're adding a number of wayside <coughs> detectors. These are uh, detectors that are built into the track and can detect various problems with the, with the rail car, whether it be overheated bearings, uh, the uh, uneven movement of the wheels, uh, uh, something that's called hunting, where the uh, wheels kind of go back and forth on the track. Uh, but they can detect these various things. The, the requirement is every 40 miles. Uh, we've got them pretty much more frequently than that even. Uh, so this is another layer of, layer of inspection. What happens is the train goes over this device. If, there, if it detects a problem, it sends a message to the train crew alerting them what car is uh, experiencing this, this problem. They can stop the train, do a visual inspection, and then take uh, uh, steps based on that. Uh, the, Cars themselves, uh, as I said, were, uh, are inspected uh, both mechanically, but also at, uh, when we receive the train, there's an inspection done. Uh, they have to go through a major inspection. Uh, it, we have, uh, a question was asked about uh, the number of inspectors we have. In Minnesota, for track inspections, BNSF has about 30 people who spend at least part of their job inspecting track in Minnesota. Some of them work across state lines in Wisconsin, the Dakotas, or Iowa. But there are 30 jobs uh, that have all are part of their responsibility to, to be inspecting Minnesota track. Uh, with mechanical forces, we have, uh, I believe, 76 car inspectors stationed in, in Minnesota, basically at, uh, at our yard at Northtown uh, in northern Minneapolis, a uh, major inspection point. So we have a, a number of people on the job uh, doing the inspections as well as the mechanical inspections of the equipment while it's in transit. Um, question was asked about uh, uh, amount of foam, for example. The Twin Cities area, uh, there's a pretty good supply of foam from the rail industry that both BNSF and CP have foam trailers uh, in the Minneapolis area. We also have uh, trailers at uh, uh, the Fargo Moorhead area. And uh, we, we started putting these around the system when we began hauling ethanol uh, several years ago. So we've been very proactive on this uh, subject. We've also done a great deal of training, uh, as has been mentioned. This year, BNSF alone has trained more than 1,000 local emergency responders at home. Plus, uh, there's a program established by the rail industry where we uh, send people, first responders, to a comprehensive multi-day school in Pueblo, Colorado. Uh, we pay airfare, hotel, meals for them to go and get hands-on experience with oil train fires and how to handle them and whatnot. So we've been uh, putting a great deal of effort into the training effort. We've been doing training for a number of years. This isn't something that just started, but it has been stepped up uh, in the past year. Um, 
Also, the, uh, uh, we have a number of uh, contractors on call for emergencies. Uh, again, these are people who are OSHA certified uh, uh, emergency responders. We have our own people at various locations, including the Twin Cities, Fargo, Moorhead, who, uh, who are also OSHA certified hazardous materials responders. So we have a number of people in, involved. We have a, a great deal of equipment, access to private equipment through contractors, various support organizations, uh, a lot of uh, plans that had been in place already before uh, the legislation was passed last year, a lot of training programs. So this is a, a subject that we have taken very seriously. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, with the investment that we've been making, substantial investment, that's also a key to safety as well. There's been a steady uh, decline in rail accidents over the 30 years that I've been in the industry. Uh, they're down dramatically from where they were uh, just a few years ago. Uh, that, that's because of the uh, consistent attention and expenditures that have been made by the rail industry. Thank you. From St. Petersburg. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this question goes back to one I had earlier as well, and that is just in regards to just the capacity. I mean, you talked about all the different increases in productivity or product being shipped in your uh, company. Is there a waiting list right now for cars and, and trains to get um, capacity on the on the rail lines that you currently manage? And and if so, how long long is that? And, and what steps are you taking to, to accommodate those? Mr. Chair, Representative, just to be clear, are you talking about current customers who are waiting? I believe that uh, we still have we have a few days delay with some grain cars, but I think by and large that problem was uh, was caught up with back in uh, August. I think, in fact, we've reached the point where we've had uh, uh, grain elevators turn away train sets that have been delivered to them. So we're we're we've been essentially caught up with that line of traffic. Also, we've caught up uh, I think pretty much with coal traffic. Minnesota Power was uh, an area of concern. I believe their stockpiles are back pretty much to normal. We're not sure where Excel is. We haven't been getting uh, reports from them. Uh, other commodities where there have been concerns include taconite. We've made a, a big dent in that. Uh, with one company, at least, we're, we're caught up uh, and substantially caught up with another one. Uh, propane, I don't believe there have been any propane delivery issues at all this year. So uh, the service issues have largely been caught up with, especially as the uh, track capacity projects from the summer and the summer maintenance program have been wrapped up. Rep. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your testimony. Just to follow up on the question, uh, there's a lot of grain in the countryside anticipating perhaps a, at some point in time an increase in price of uh, grain. One would anticipate more real, uh, demand for the cars. Uh, how do you prepare for that? Are, are you prepared for, uh, how do you anticipate the increased demand for the trains in, in, uh, to carry grain. Mr. Mr. Representative, we uh, watch the markets, of course. We also, through our uh, uh, car auction program, works at car futures program, if you will, helps us pr uh, project what the demand is going to be down the road. Uh, we are constantly watching what's going on with international markets, domestic markets, and what the trends are. Uh, we have our fleet. Uh, uh, grain car fleet uh, in place, uh, if, if necessary, we'll pull cars out of storage or acquire cars from other locations. Uh, with last year's situation, I just, I, I need to point out that uh, while our service was not what our customers wanted, we hauled a record volume of grain out of the upper Midwest area last year, Montana, the Dakotas, and Minnesota. It was an all-time record for volume. It wasn't as fast, it wasn't as smooth as people wanted, but there was a lot of, of traffic that did move. And it, as I said, it's, it was a matter of everything being up that was causing the traffic backlogs that we had. And uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then on another topic, you mentioned that you store <coughs> foam in the Twin Cities and you store foam in, in Fargo-Moorhead. I immediately thought of Motley. What about Motley or Wadeen or Purim if there's an accident there? It seems like that's a long ways. Would the foam come by rail or by truck? From Fargo or from uh, Minneapolis, Mr. Chair, represents. No, actually, we've uh, made a point of making sure that we have it stationed every uh, 250 miles or so across the system, so that no place is more than 100 miles away. Uh, as Dave Christensen mentioned, it's not something where you just run out right away and start pumping something on the fire. 
uh, the first steps are evacuation and so on. It can move by, uh, by highway. It, some of these trailers can actually be airlifted by helicopter if need be to get on site. Johnson. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And then finally, Mr. Sweeney, then how, what would Motley expect as their time, the time frame that, to get that delivered to them? Mr. Chair, Representative, probably uh, no more than a couple hours from the request coming in. Representative Uglin. I think, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Clark got, uh, took care of my question. Okay. Thank you. Representative Hornstein. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I understand that the railroads have to file some emergency response plans with the PCA. Is that correct? Uh, you, you file some kind of worst case scenario emergency plan document? Mr. Mr. Chair, Representative, we, uh, the legislation required us to file our response plans uh, uh, that has you know, certain times to provide various resources and personnel. Right, but I, I know that was in the legislation, and I appreciate that you, that you all signed off on that. The pipeline companies didn't in terms of rapid response to oil spills. But there's a, uh, my understanding is that there's a specific emergency preparedness plan that you file with the state. Is that correct? I, I was told that uh, by, by MnDOT in the statute that maybe Mr. Burris has information. Is there some kind of requirement that the railroads file a, some kind of emergency response plan with Mr. The state Chair? Agency? Represent. I'll have to double check on exactly what we have to file. I'm, I'm not. Okay. I'm not well, certain. Well, Mr. Chair, it's my understanding that you need to, but if not, I know that the railroads have have these. You have your own internal, uh, uh, you know, worst case scenario response plans, and I think that would be really useful to share, you know, with the committee. I mean, I'm looking around. We have everybody almost has some oil or hazardous materials going through their communities. And I'm looking at South St. Paul and Fridley and Anoka and Coon Rapids and Representative Draskowski has that whole uh, spur along the river, uh, Red Wing. I mean, every one of us. I've got ethanol in, in going through my district in the Kenilworth Corridor. So I think it would be really useful for us to, to you know, have those plans to, to see what you guys are thinking in terms of worst case scenarios and um, make sure that, uh, you know, the, the proper agencies um, you know, also have those plans so that you know the public can can be better able to respond. So I guess I would make that request, and um, you know I think it would help us move the ball forward in terms of our emergency preparedness. That's something you can get us, Mr. Sweeney. I'll check into that. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Representative Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Mr. Sweeney, if the uh, Sandpiper Pipeline were built, operating, and oc fully occupied tomorrow. Uh, what would that do to your available capacity of uh, your lines to um, uh, other commodities like corn and soybeans? And uh, what would it do to the uh, price, uh, uh, the, the, the ability uh, for you to offer lower prices or uh, the inability for you to charge higher prices? Mr. Sweeney. Oh. Mr. Chair, Representative, that's uh, certainly something to ponder. I, I really don't have a, a, a ready answer for you. Um, to the extent that uh, a commodity is diverted to another mode of transportation, then, uh, then yes, the capac the whatever capacity that has been consuming would be available for something else, assuming there is something else to fill it. Uh, all commodities have ebbs and flows. Uh, for example, coal uh, two or three years ago was going to go away, but instead it came back uh, uh, almost stronger than ever. Uh, because of changes in natural gas prices. Uh, grain certainly fluctuates tremendously each year. Uh, one thing, too, the fewer customers that are sharing a line, uh, that means that there are that many fewer customers sharing the cost, the fixed costs involved in that line, and that can have an effect on rates as well. Uh, the, the fewer the customers, uh, the, the greater the percentage of the, the load they would have to shoulder. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. So um, if your train is sitting around, um, are you uh, liable to see a downward pressure on, on the, uh, the prices or, or the uh, fee for hauling uh, commodities on that train regardless of the commodity? Or if it's fully scheduled, uh, would you see lower prices? Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, it would depend on the commodity, the markets that are involved. Uh, it, it's impossible to just uh, given off the top of my head answer to that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Nash. 
Well, clearly, Representative, Mr. Chair, clearly Representative Dr Driskowski and I are sitting too close to one another and we had the same question, so. Okay. Representative <laughs> Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Sweeney, I just had a, you know, right now it seems like there's enough uh, freight to be transported and recently we came out of the recession a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit about your plans for storage during downturns? Uh, hopefully we don't have a, as big of a downturn as we've had, but uh, there was some concern in my community about a uh, storage of rails, uh, empty, empty uh, trains, train cars. Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, yes, during the depths of the recession, I think it was something like one third of all U.S. rail cars were in storage, uh, as well as locomotives that we had been purchasing at a price of about two million dollars a piece. Uh, that was right now our biggest infrastructure challenge is capacity for moving freight. Tra <coughs> Back then, our biggest capacity challenge was finding some place to put all the cars that we had to put in storage. Uh, we had uh, cars that were parked for years at a time, and it, yes, it became a problem. Hopefully, we won't experience that again. But when it, if should it happen again, uh, yes, we would have to uh, find whatever available track there, there was to put it. Mr. Appitz, were you going to testify okay. as well? If we lay off Mr. Sweeney, I'd be happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we just have two, two more questions. I just wanted to sure. make sure. Uh, Representative Hausman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to quickly clarify numbers on your two handouts. Uh, in 2014, you plan to invest $5 billion. In 2015, you have a $6 billion capital plan. Is it really going to be $11 billion over two years? <coughs> Mr. Chair, Representative, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw there are charts that will show that when you add, if you put railroads in with the states for the amount of money that railroads spend maintaining their, their right of way, uh, both BNSF and Union Pacific would be in like the top seven for all states. Okay. Mr. Appitz. Well, you Chairman, the there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is John Appitz. I'm with the law firm of Messerly and Kramer, and I represent another sort of segment of the rail industry called the Minnesota Regional Railroads Association, which is commonly known as the short line industry. And if you think about your body, you think about the arteries that are the major arteries, and you're looking at Mr. Sweeney here, if you think about the veins and the capillaries, you're thinking about the short line railroads, the railroads that bring stuff to Mr. Sweeney and it moves across the, uh, the nation. Uh, that's the group that uh, <clears throat> I represent along with, uh, with uh, others of the class ones as well. And one of the things I just want to say is Minnesota is a rail rich state. I like to say that because it's true. Uh, we've got the ninth most track in the nation and we are rich in terms of the numbers of railroads that serve this fine state. There's four class ones. Mr. Sweeney's got the Burlington Northern Santa Fe, but there's the Union Pacific, the Canadian Pacific, as well as the uh, Canadian National, all of which serve different parts of the state and compete for a good measure of the, uh, of the freight that moves in this state. There are 16 short lines, 16 of those capillaries that serve uh, Minnesota, and we move about, as Mr. Um, Mr. Christensen said, about a third of everything that moves in this state. 38% of the freight that moves in Minnesota moves on a railroad. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I have a confession to make. I was a history major in college, and that's why I handed out this chart. Um, that's maybe why I'm a lobbyist as well. So caution your children about becoming history majors. But um, I wanted to show you the back of this chart real quick here. Uh, this is what the rail system in Minnesota looked like in the 1950s. This is when we had the most track that was ever built in this, nation, in this uh, state of Minnesota. The other side is the rail system today. And what you see is a consolidation of a lot of the, a lot of the track and a lot of the, uh, the activity okay. to the routes that were most profitable and most, <coughs> excuse me, and where there's the most activity. Uh, again, this is the rail system today, but there's been a lot of constriction just because it's become much more efficient, much more effective, and uh, utilized in a much more efficient, uh, in, in efficient fashion. I want to also add a couple other things as well. If uh, Mr. Uh, Christensen also said we've been operating in Minnesota for about 150 years. If you want to see the first locomotive that ran in the state of Minnesota, then take a look at the William Crooks that happens to be up at the Duluth, Muse um, Duluth Railroad Museum and is on the cover of this uh, information about Minnesota railroads. You each have, I think, a CD in your packet 
uh, that is this. It's our hit CD. It's our information about Minnesota railroads. Um, and if you want to find out most anything about a railroad, <coughs> where they operate, uh, maps of the railroads, and contacts at the railroads, just turn that on or take a look uh, um, at the material on our website, which is at minnesotarailroads.com. I give you this in your packets as well because it'll tell you a little bit about the effect and the impact of railroads in the state of Minnesota. As I said, eighth most track in the nation. We also have about 4,100 employees in the state who are paid about $306 million a year and we pay property taxes, everybody's got to mention this when the business steps up, of about $39 million, uh, $39 million in the state. So we contribute in various ways uh, to the state. We are concerned about the safety of our employees and we are concerned about the safety of every community that we run through. We'd be foolish not to. And we are in large measure because it is a dangerous industry. These are big things that are moving down the tracks. And when they collide with a car or some other sort of vehicle, you know the outcome. You've seen the outcome and Mr. Christensen showed you, showed you the outcome. So safety is the primary concern of railroads. And you can see um, in looking at this other little piece of paper I put in your materials, the record of safety that has uh, kind of inspired railroads going forward in the United States. I pulled up some material from what's called the AAR, the Association of American Railroads, uh, just for your reference. And you can go to their website and take a look at some of the other information that they have uh, available to you. But we've had a precipitous drop in the number of people who are hurt, killed, uh, or injured on our, on our properties and in our employ. And an increase in safety uh, all, across, all across this country. That's good for us, but the communities that we work in also have to be safe. And I know um, uh, Representative uh, Hornstein has a particular concern about that, and we've been trying to address that and working with him over the, the last couple of years. Um, Mr. Christensen said there had been a, a big increase in the amount of training that's been going on in the state of Minnesota. That's partially true. There's been a lot of training of local first responders going on in the state of Minnesota and all along rail lines for many, many years. Uh, that's how we keep these communities safe, working with the people who are on the ground with the materials, equipment, and training to respond to incidents should they arise. I got a little piece of something in your materials here again that talk about community safety as well. How we work with those communities. And Mr. Sweeney indicated that uh, we do send a lot of uh, responders to special training in uh, Pueblo, uh, Colorado, where they go through a very specific, and ori uh, specific orientation to, most recently, crude oil hazards and crude oil uh, uh, training. Finally, there is a very specific thing that goes to um, what the rail industry has been doing in response to crude oil movement. Crude oil movement has increased dramatically, as Mr. Um, uh, Christensen said, it's gone from very, uh, just a few barrels to millions of barrels a year. And so you got to make preparation for that. The railroad industry and the United States government came to an agreement over a variety of things that Mr. Sweeney went through. Testing of brakes, uh, testing of track, testing of cars, Im Im improvements to cars. And I want to correct a statement that was made before. The rail industry is not attempting to slow down the rulemaking or the improvement of rail cars. We are trying to keep it moving and increase that, the speed of that. It is good for us. We move this stuff because we have to. We're a common carrier. That's our responsibility. And the safer the uh, cars that we're moving, the safer the communities we move through. Um, let me just say one other thing, and we're going to talk about this, I think, next week, uh, Mr. Chairman, and that is what railroads do in terms of the communities that they run through and the economic development that they can generate. Uh, we'll have here a couple of folks who can talk to you specifically about rail economic development. We call it FRED, Freight Rail Economic Development. The uh, um, uh, department did a study on this along with the Department of Economic Development a year ago. We got sidetracked, as we say in the industry, forgive me, mm -hmm. in a discussion of that, thank you, in a discussion of that, <coughs> and uh, we'll have a chance to talk about that next time around, I, I hope. I want to just mention in closing, because I think you have a couple of their witnesses who wanted to testify. There are a few issues that are near and dear to our hearts that are likely to come before you and you're going to hear some conversation about. One is the um, possibility of increasing the weight of trucks that move on Minnesota's highways. 
Uh, railroads have a lo for a long time been very concerned about that, both because heavier trucks affect the uh, construction and the uh, of the highways they move on. They're less safe. Uh, they have a greater impact on the roads. But I'll tell you what they also do. They also move freight off of particularly the short lines, the small railroads. And we'll talk about that later. But rail f or truck weights are of a particular concern to the railroad to the railroad industry. Finally, um, Representative Houseman mentioned an issue that's near and dear to our hearts, and that is the fact that uh, railroad police, and we do have security forces that, operate, that work, work for the railroads, operate as authorized police officers in 48 of 50 states in this nation. Where they don't, where they're not certified officers, are Minnesota and Wyoming. We've been asking for years for the opportunity to make these just regular certified officers, which gives them various police powers, obviously. Powers of arrest when somebody's on our property and their authority rests on the property that they operate on. Uh, arrest authority, uh, booking authority, investigative authority, authorities like that that we don't have today. We've been in this discussion and debate for over 20 years. We haven't been very successful in moving forward, but I just wanted to say that Representative Houseman, that is an issue that continues to be of concern to us, and if we have occasion to talk about uh, talk about that, it would be it would be great. Finally, Mr. Chairman, there is a lot of activity going on at the federal level with the very issues that we're talking about here: uh, safety, inventories of equipment, etc., which we could take time to talk about later on. But Minnesota isn't alone in this conversation. Minnesota is in the vanguard, but one of several states that are talking about this because this is interstate commerce and it is governed in many ways by rules and regulations of the federal government and we are a common carrier we have to carry it if you want to move it and we'll continue to do that as best we can thank you mr Appetz. uh thank you representative nash for holding your question you had a question <coughs> earlier mr chair thank you uh question for mr sweeney mr sweeney um you talked about the possibility of pressing older cars into service and we had talked earlier about other cars, I believe they were called time bombs. Uh, what's the relative safety level of those cars that you've got in storage? How long would it take to bring them back online uh, to create that extra capacity? Mr. Sweeney. Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, were you talking about oil cars specifically or just cars in general? Mr. Uh, Chair, I believe you said grain cars would be brought back online and I, my question related to their relative safety and time to bring them back online. Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, yes, they would be uh, given mechanical inspections, whatever uh, repairs would be necessary to qualify or to meet uh, FRA standards for operation. It would, uh, depending on how many we had to pull out of storage and where they are, it could take a, a few weeks. Representative Yuglin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Directed to Mr. Sweeney. Mr. Sweeney, it, it's been pretty well documented uh, the cost to uh, consumers and farmers and things about you know the delays in grain shipments and things and and also the same for uh, you know energy consumers I think it's fair to say that everybody paid higher electric bills and things because we didn't get enough coal and we and we were forced to buy off the grid um, what would the what would the uh, savings be or would it be fair to assume that if we did build the sandpiper hopefully we do and you reduce reduce that demand will you be able to uh, provide cost savings to uh, consumers in the future with uh, shipments and things and cost savings to uh, farmers in the agricultural sector mr. chair representative if I understand it what you're asking is uh, would we provide savings by being able to handle more of those specific commodities in a faster basis to the extent it would improve service uh, and that shows up in their in their final uh, statement yes okay thank you thanks mr. chair um, I just wanted to be very briefly I, I want to make sure I heard mr. Appitz right because that was a huge statement if uh, I, you know this is if it's accurate my understanding you had said that um, you don't have a problem with the US DOT draft rule of a three-year phase out of the dot 111 cars I, I think you said something to the effect that you're you're not in opposition you know you had made a statement about you know in right. response to my statement about the the lobbying efforts of the railroad so is that if that's the case that I would gladly stand corrected so 
Um, does the railroad industry now support the draft U.S. DOT phase out of three years for the DOT 111 cars? Yeah. yeah. The answer is yes. It is. Okay. So that's Answers. important breaking could, news then. Thank could, you. Could I just mention one other thing to Mr. <laughs> Chairman? And that is right. there was a comment made about um, Minnesota not benefiting from the increased activity of railroads, particularly with regard to crude oil movements. If anybody filled up this past week or the past couple of weeks, I think they felt some of the benefit that comes from the fact that railroads were able to move that oil from the Bakken to the refineries. I think we've all noticed that, and I think it has some would suggest that that is a large measure of the phenomenon that's made the U.S. economy, uh, allowed the U.S. economy to come on, come back around. It wouldn't be moving otherwise, as everybody knows, without the railroads being there. And hopefully we've made a difference that way. Thank you. One last question, Representative Powell, then we'll get to our other testifiers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And my question comes on the on your BNSF's capital plan, what I don't see on here, and maybe it's it's looped into one of these other, is is the additional track lane uh, between Becker and Big Lake. Is that in here, or is that not made the cut? Mr. Chair, Representative, yes, it's in there. It's item number, let's see, one that says, number 16, Staples Sub, one CTC signaling project and three double track projects. And the Big Lake to Becker is uh, to be done this year, I believe. Well, that's good news. It's, Mr. Chair, it's, uh, it's quite a stretch to go from Becker to, to Staples, but uh, I, I thank you for putting that in there. Yeah, it, Mr. Chair, Representative, just to be clear, part, portions of that subdivision are, are already double tracked. This is filling in the gaps. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And we now have. Uh, Mr. Qualley and Mr. Brown, United Transportation Union, and Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen. <coughs> Welcome to the committee, gentlemen, and please state your name and proceed. Mr. Chairman, uh, it's a privilege to sit before your committee, and uh, for those of you that have been on the committee before, uh, nice to meet you as well. My name is Philip Qualley. I'm State Director for the United Transportation Union which is now the Transportation Division of the Sheet Metal Air, Rail, and Transit Union, or SMART. Uh, I am a conductor of 35 years. I am a certified conductor. Uh, I've also uh, been hazmat trained at the National Labor College, as Ms. Brown has as well. Uh, we've uh, been trained in hazardous material response for some years now. I also sit on the uh, Federal Railroad Administration uh, Switching Operation Fatality Analysis Working Group uh, my comments will be brief. Uh, we have 1,400 members in the state of Minnesota, and uh, we are the men and women who uh, actually operate the trains and, uh, of Minnesota. Uh, we are doing so with two persons on each train crew. Uh, our mission is 100% safety. Uh, we would like to comment that one year ago, uh, uh, BNSF spokesperson Amy Macbeth said that 99.998% uh, of all hazardous material is reaching its destination safely. Uh, we concur, and I would like to say that our mission as train crews is 100% daily. Uh, that said, uh, we would like to compliment MnDOT, the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, and all of the work that is being done in this state. Uh, we want to compliment the legislature for some of the fantastic work that is nation leading for uh, prepared emergency responders and so on. And uh, we'd generally like to um, concur with the reports we've heard today from MnDOT and uh, also um, uh, confirm what BNSF is reporting uh, to the legislature today. Uh, finally, uh, I'd just like to mention uh, the Lac Magnetic uh, Quebec uh, train derailment was mentioned earlier, and that tragedy uh, was not an accident, that was an incident, a completely avoidable incident. Uh, we would like to comment that uh, we think the root cause was a one-person train crew, and it did not, uh, that it, uh, train securement execution was not properly uh, performed. And then secondly, regarding Castleton train derailment, a little closer to home approximately, uh, 50, uh, 56 weeks ago, uh, I just want to com comment on the remarkable work that was done by two train crews simultaneously uh, with two persons on each train crew. 
Uh, our crews went in and cut away those tank cars, uh, went into harm's way, and again, that's a public, uh, you know, operational benefit. Um, that said, uh, just want to close by saying today we are doing the best we can with what we are being provided uh, uh, by the railroad companies. Uh, and finally, uh, our members are all across the state and many retirees, uh, and we are supporting our main street economies with the money we earn. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Mr. Brown? Uh, good morning uh, or afternoon, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want uh, to uh, and esteemed members of the committee. I want to uh, um, first tell you my name is Dave Brown. I am the uh, uh, Minnesota State Legislative Board Chairman for the uh, Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen. I'm also the uh, Re National Region 3 State Legislative Chairman for the 12 surrounding states. Um, well, I'm also, uh, uh, we're, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers is the founding members for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters Rail Conference with over 100,000 members. Uh, for uh, since 1863, over 150 years, uh, the BLET has worked with industry, the government, and other rail unions to make certain that railroads provide for the safety of our members, the public, and most important, the environment. On behalf of the more than 38,000 active BLET members and over, and over 100,000 IBT rail conference members, I want to express my appreciation for the opportunity to sit before you today. Um, our perception and that of rural labor of these safety related issues that were before you today may differ from that of railroads. Our vision comes from the highly skilled, professional, hardworking rail workers that work days, nights, holidays, 24 7, 365 days a year, moving the states and this nation's people and freight, the backbone of this nation's railroad. We are the first responders to accidents and derailments. We are uniquely positioned to provide good judgment and ideas regarding the types of changes and recommendations that would make our industry safer and more secure. <coughs> the Brotherhood of uh, Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen will continue to seek opportunities to work with this committee, the carriers and federal agencies on legislative regulatory priorities that strengthen the safety of moving America's passengers and freight as a normal course of our activity. I am also on the work uh, committee of the uh, Railroad Safety uh, Advisory Committee in D.C. Uh, concerning uh, hazmat issues with these 111A cars, uh, also train securement and crew size. Uh, crew size is very essential to a safe movement of freight in this nation on these railroads. Um, I can't uh, begin to tell you after 43 years of service as a locomotive engineer uh, for the uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, how important it's come from having five members on a crew to two. The two are the bottom line to the safety of ourselves and the safety of the public. <clears throat> Crossing incidents have notoriously caused heartache to the people involved with the crossings in the cars and the trucks and the, and, and the pedestrians, but also to the train crews. There is incidents, uh, there was a bus, school bus that was hit up in uh, Grand, Rapid, uh, Grand Forks in the outside. Uh, if it hadn't been for the conductor being on the train crew, there would have been more fatalities. Uh, the conductor immediately went back, as they always do, and inspected the train and made for the safe movement of that train to clear that crossing so the ambulances could uh, uh, provide uh, needed uh, uh, assistance to the, uh, the students. Um, I would close with uh, uh, that I would uh, like, well, like once again to thank you, Chairman Kelly, for allowing me to come before the, this committee and look forward to working with you and the carriers and uh, uh, other vested individuals. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. We do have a, a question from uh, Representative Sandine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, pose a question to uh, uh, Mr. Qualley there. Uh, I'd like you to, to explain the length of some of these trains that are uh, transport, transporting the oil and then uh, how many men are on those crew how many personnel are on those crews is that enough uh, to provide for the safety if you have to break a train or whatever you have to do in case of an emergency <coughs> mr. chairman uh, representative thank you for your question uh, we're doing so on unit oil trains with two persons uh, a certified engineer and a certified conductor 
Uh, oil trains are generally running anywhere from 100 to 110 cars. It's considered a unit train. We have one buffer uh, car uh, between the occupied locomotive consist and the train. Federally, as an aside, uh, we are trying and we appeal to the FIMSA and the Federal Railroad Administration for a five car buffer so it gives us a little bit of time to get out of the train with deliver our hazardous material information to for emergency responders and save uh, our own lives frankly uh, should there be a derailment. Uh, with a second person on the train, of course, the ground person is giving that train roll-by inspections along the train's route, mechanical, 14-point uh, uh, Appendix D, mechanical inspections, roll-bys of other trains passing. Uh, we are always on a position on that train to, uh, as the train slows down and we have to cut crossings and keep public crossings open, we are in a position to drop off the side of the train as it's moving at low speed. The and then guide the train to its stopping point where we can immediately open the crossing and keep crossings open for the general public. Uh, as far as, just very quickly, if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, to your question about overall trains, a train can run from one car behind a locomotive <coughs> consist to as high as 214 cars, or almost two miles plus long that I've seen in my career. Uh, the key piece being is that with motive power, distributed power, uh, we are running longer and heavier trains and the railroads have every single right and responsibility to do so for their shareholders. So uh, we may not like it, but we're the men and women who run the trains. We're doing so as safely as we can. Thank you. You're welcome. I represent Runbeck, our final question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Brown, when you mentioned that railroads are moving people and freight, and I just wondered if in Minnesota we have railroads that are moving people. Yes, we do. Uh, North Star uh, uh, well, uh, commuter rail is uh, a BNSF crewed uh, uh, trains. Okay, so we're and Amtrak they're, as well. They're kind Amtrak of as well. It, it fall into both categories, uh, that North Star corridor. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, for members, we will be back here in, uh, not back here, we'll be in room five on Monday. We will have MnDOT's uh, overview, and so we look forward to that. Thank you for your time. This means adjourned.